Well, if you look around the world, it's easy, it's easy to look like evil is prospering. Over the past two months, we've heard of the Taliban taking control of Afghanistan. As civilians' executions have been reinstated, allies of the former government have been jailed, people have been evicted from their homes, where girls can no longer attend school, where people live in fear. And I remember hearing about three young people who fell out of a US cargo plane to their death because the fear of falling off the back of the plane was less than the fear of living under Taliban rule. How could God allow such an evil nation to have their way over a democratic government that was committed to seeking equality and justice for their citizens? What is God doing about this evil? Well, this is very much the situation Habakkuk is facing in his day. Last week, we discussed the question, how will God react when things aren't the way they should be? Habakkuk cried out for justice because of the violence happening within God's own people, Judah. And the Lord told Habakkuk that he was raising up the evil Babylonians to punish Judah. Justice will come, but it's not the kind of justice Habakkuk expected. In verse 12, we hear Habakkuk's second complaint. He says, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. In a nutshell, Habakkuk is wondering, and this is the first question, isn't God good? Isn't God good? Because the math doesn't seem to add up. In verse 12, it's like Habakkuk is writing out a maths equation. He starts with what? He knows about God. On the one side of the equation, he writes down, God is good. And on the other side of the equals side, we expect to see, therefore, God's plans in history will be obviously good as well. But instead, God has chosen the evil Babylon to bring judgment on Judah. This is how it must have looked like to Habakkuk. Imagine the prefects at school, the ones who are meant to be leaders, have become bullies. So you tell the principal to do something about him. Then the next day, you see that the principal has hired an even worse bully, a professional bully, to bully not just the bully, but everyone. It just doesn't make any sense. In verse 14 to 17, we have a description of how the Babylonians treated the nations they conquered. In verse 14, Habakkuk says, you made us like helpless fish without a leader. And this placed Judah in a very vulnerable position. As verse 15 says, he brings all of them up with a hook. They, they seem just as likely to kill Christians as the wicked. Why doesn't God protect God's people? They are preyed upon like fish in a barrel. Or worse yet, Babylon is like a sinister boy with a magnifying glass laughing as he burns the Israelites like ants. It's as if God is reclining in a deck chair, sipping his fruit juice while all of the evil happens right in front of him. And the key issue Habakkuk has is if God is good, what is he going to do? Habakkuk's dilemma raises an important issue for us. What do you do with your doubts? What do you do with your doubts? Can you imagine how confused Habakkuk was? And in a similar way, we might doubt God's goodness when we see non-Christians living successful lives while Christians we know struggle in life. And so here are two choices. We can either give up or seek God. Some people blame God for the bad stuff that happens in their life. And how will you respond when bad stuff happens in your life? You can either give up on God or you can doubt your doubts. You can seek God for an answer that you may not yet have considered. And the answer that we learn from Habakkuk is God is bigger than we think. God is bigger than we think. I want to ask you a question. What is your framework for God? When bad stuff happens, is your God big enough or do you limit him based on what you think he should do? And what we need to learn from Habakkuk is that God stands behind evil without being responsible for it. God stands behind evil without being responsible for it. God's answer to Habakkuk shows that not even evil takes place outside the bounds of his control or sovereignty. And yet we do what we want to do and we are fairly punished for it. Now we might think that's not fair. 
But Paul answers in Romans 9 in the New Testament that we have no right as the clay to complain to the potter about what he chooses to do with us. What we really need to do is we must leave room for mystery with God. We mustn't limit God when he doesn't fit into our mass equation. It's not our business to know all of God's mystery. Instead, we should ask the question, is God not big enough to use evil for good? And we see this with Jesus. As Acts verse 20, uh, 2, chapter 2, verse 23 says, This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosening the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. If God is in control of evil so that he brought good through the darkest day where evil seemed to triumph the most, then the seemingly unfortunate, inconvenient, or even horrible things in your life are part of God's plan too. And he will use them as a means of saving you as you trust in him. Not even the greatest evil, Romans 8 says, can separate us from Jesus and his love. Okay, so we're encouraged to take our doubts to God and to seek God. This leads to the second question, when will God answer? When will God answer us? In chapter 2, verse 1, we read, I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Here Habakkuk provides a model for us because Habakkuk took his questions to God. Habakkuk's example leads to a question for us. Do you talk to God about your concerns as much as you talk to others about it? Do you talk to God about your concerns as much as you talk to others about it? There is a good litmus test for our trust in God to answer us. We also learn Habakkuk didn't take matters into his own hands. Habakkuk worried about God's silence, just as we worry about the things that don't seem to go the way that we expect. Habakkuk didn't try and make sense of it rationally. He didn't try and fix it himself. Instead, Habakkuk waited for God to make things clear through his word in his timing. When you read the Bible, are you patient and expectant that God will actually answer you? I don't mean tell you what to do in every situation, but to provide wisdom with how to respond to the ups and downs of life. If you have a question, then can I encourage you to search the Bible and ask your leaders if you're struggling to find the answer. And while you're waiting for answers, remember, we know enough to trust God now. We know enough to trust God now. When I married Pip, I didn't know everything about her, but I knew enough of her character to know that I could trust her. Likewise, you don't need to know all the answers to be able to trust God because he's revealed the biggest mystery of all. He's proven that he loves you and that he has done something about injustice and evil by taking the punishment for our sin on the cross. There is no more important mystery for us to know. Habakkuk's second question was, when will God answer? And God's response is, God's plans take longer than we expect. God, God's plans take longer than we expect. Habakkuk is told to wait on God. We read in verse 3, For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Impatience is the normal human response to God's promise to answer his people. In a day when we are increasingly impatient, when we get frustrated when our Netflix show takes more than five seconds to load, God assures us, wait patiently. The end, when Jesus returns to set all things right, may seem delayed, but nothing will stop it. Therefore, the faithful build their life upon God's promises. Verse 4 says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Would the righteous be consumed with the guilty? Will the Guilty go unpunished. The answer, the righteous person and not the wicked shall live. How? By his faith in God and in his promises. This verse is one of the key verses in scripture. It's picked up three times in the New Testament. In Romans 1 and in Galatians 3, it refers to being declared right before God through faith. 
So you have eternal life through faith, just like a judge declares someone not guilty. And in Hebrews 10, it is used to talk about persevering in faithful obedience, even when things get tough. I think faith and faithfulness are two sides of the same coin. The one who has faith and a right relationship with God will live faithfully and obediently. Those who have faith will show their faith in how they live. If I have faith in a bridge over a chasm to hold me, but I won't cross it, I'm not living by that faith. As such, the person who has faith will build their life on the confidence that God will be faithful to his promises. For Habakkuk, it meant trusting God, even though it would take 70 years before the Babylonians were defeated and they could return back to their homeland. 70 years he had to wait. The final thing God tells Habakkuk is that the proud will fall eventually. God will not abandon his people. From verse 5 to 20, God gives his people words to speak to their enemies in the form of woes. These are words of judgment against Babylon's um, stealing of things in verse 6 to 8, their unjust wealth in verse 9 to 11, their bloodshed in verse 12 to 14, their drunkenness in verse 15 to 17, and trusting and created things in verse 18 to 20. It's as if to say how terrible for them. Why does God give these words of judgment to God's people to say? Well, it's to reassure them that evil will not have the final word. Okay, so let's do a recap. When Habakkuk asked, why don't you do something? God answered, I will do something soon by bringing the Babylonians to you. I'll put an end to Jerusalem's corruption. But what about Babylon's wickedness? Came the reply, will you tolerate that? But God answered, no, they will only last for a while, 70 years, then I will destroy them too. And so in verse 20, God reminds Habakkuk that he is the awesome sovereign God in control of all things. One day, all the world will be silent before him in fear is their judge. In the new creation, all things will be set right. Interestingly, in Revelation, the Bible uses Babylon to refer to anyone who lives in a way that ignores or opposes God. Like Babylon, we can easily trust in how successful we are. Our grades, where we live, the schools we go to, how good we are at sports or at music. For our success, we re rely on and give credit to almost anything beside God. We give credit to our intelligence, our wealth, our logic, our strength our pride, our status, our birth, how much we wanted it, our problem-solving skills, all of these are gifts from God and we too easily give ourselves the credit for them. They are worshipped every time we rely on them without reference to God, every time we are proud of our accomplishments without noticing where they came from, every time we take credit without thanking God and every time we get money or marks or friendship by taking advantage of others. So we need to hear God's warning against the proud. The proud will fall eventually. We need to ask for forgiveness and God will willingly forgive. And we need to hear God's word to encourage Christians. Habakkuk 2 provides practical help for times when our foundations are shaken, when we receive bad news that someone we love will soon die, when peace and security are quickly moving towards war and destruction, and or that the people we look up to in the faith have turned out to be really big sinners. When our personal world is shaken to the core, we can have hope that God is still at work. British shepherds often take sheep one by one and throw them into um, this big, huge vat thrill, filled with antiseptic liquid. The shepherd must completely submerge each animal, holding its ears, eyes, and nose under the surface. It is, of course, horribly frightening for the sheep and any of the sheep if any of the sheep try and climb out of the trough too soon the sheep dogs bark and snap and force them back in um, next slide thanks Sean. but as terrifying an experience as it is for the sheep without the periodic treatment they would become victims of parasites and disease it's for their good as one christian writer witnesses this process they couldn't help but remember Jesus is called our good shepherd and we are his sheep. She wrote, I had some experiences in my life which have made me feel very sympathetic to those poor rams. 
I couldn't figure out any reason for the treatment I was getting from the shepherd I trusted. And he didn't give me a hint of explanation. As I watched the struggling sheep, I thought, if only there was some way to explain it. Well, we too have a good shepherd who is committed to his sheep. Though he often does things to us that frighten us and that we cannot understand at the moment, we can learn from Habakkuk that God will never abandon his people.